good morning and welcome to Now Then Alliance. Whether you're joining us in person and brave the cold or joining us from the comfort of your home or engaging later when it's maybe warmer, we're excited that you're here. Uh, we're excited that you're worshiping with us. As a church here at Now Then Alliance, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ and believe we do that best as we connect with each other, grow with uh, our own relationship with God and encourage others to do the same and participate in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. Uh, if you're here in the room, I'd love for you to find your connection card. You can fill that out. Maybe most importantly, though, on the back side, you can let us know how we can be praying for you. That's one of the ways we love to connect with you. If you're engaging digitally, you can do that through our website. You can do it through the Facebook comments as the service is live. We'd love to join you in praying with you as well and find it one of the most valuable ways that we can connect with each other. And so we'd love for you to take the time to do that. If you do that here live, you can place it in the offering basket as you, or box as you go uh, so that we can, as a staff and as many in our church uh, as are willing, we'll pray for you for those things as well. Uh, throughout the morning, uh, we're going to worship God in a number of different ways. We'll, we'll begin by singing our songs of praise to God. We'll hear of some opportunities we have to participate in what God is doing, particularly through Compassion Church. We'll hear uh, about the value of small groups and why it's good to get connected that way. And then we'll study God's Word about the importance of God's Word this morning as we continue in our rhythm series together. As we do all of that, we're hopeful to do all of it in a way that is glorifying to God, that is transformative to us, and where our hearts and spirits are open to listen to whatever He may have for us. And so I want to pray pray to that end before we begin to worship. Would you join me in that prayer? And God, we're thankful. Uh, we're thankful that we uh, are gathered to worship you, and we pray that as we do it, it would bring glory to your name. It would uh, highlight who you are in our lives and in the world, that it would strengthen our relationship with you, and that while we're doing those things, that we'd be open to how you may press new things upon our heart, how you may speak to our spirits, and how you may call us uh, into new depth in relationship with you. Use this time, uh, use our songs, use our gifts, use our attention, uh, most importantly, use your spirit and your authority in our lives to make us better. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys stand with me as we begin to sing together? We're going to sing about God's great love for us today. And then you're going to have opportunity as you understand that God's love for you to, re to react and respond to his love for you and then tell him what you feel about his love for you. So uh, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Uh, glad that you're here. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and His mercy, come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in Him. We'll live forever. Repeat after me. Oh, 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 oh. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with all. Blessings 
He does. He loves you. Let's celebrate him as we, as we sing.
together. God, we are so grateful to be here today, to feel your love, to know your love in a greater way, and then to respond to you by saying, God, we love you. And we are so thankful for you, Jesus, thankful that you came to seek and save those that were lost, and that is everybody in this room, everybody in this room, everybody watching, we are all lost without you, but we are found with you, we are made whole with you, and we are redeemed and saved with you. So thank you, Jesus. We celebrate you and we respond in our love back to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, as I mentioned earlier, as a church, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ. We believe we do that best as we're connecting, growing, and participating in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. I want to give you some opportunities for some of those. I'll highlight some connection opportunities here in just a moment. But as you're looking through your bulletin, you can see uh, our women's ministry is getting ready to start a new study. That's a great growing opportunity for you women as you're looking to engage. Maybe if you haven't been engaged uh, throughout the spring so or winter so far, as March uh, unveils, they'll have uh, new in-person studies, new digital studies. We'd encourage you to join either of those ways and continue growing in your relationship alongside others. Uh, and then a couple of different ways to participate. We're starting to remind people that in March we always do a food drive. And uh, since we've been doing that the last three or four years every March, we've uh, exceeded our previous year's uh, poundage of food that we've donated every year and are hopeful to do that again. Uh, we were uh, blessed to be able to do that as a pandemic started last March, hopeful to do that uh, this year, hopefully as a pandemic is ending, uh, that we'll be able to beat that number even again. Alongside that, there'll be opportunity not just to do uh, food for the food shelf, but uh, with the Compassion Church and Pastor Rob as they're getting ready to launch in Anoka, they've uh, set up some uh, relationship with Stepping Stone, that's a homeless shelter in Anoka, and are hoping to do care packages for all of those that are uh, residents at the shelter as we lead into Easter. So throughout March, we'll be taking donations for that as well. Just giving you a heads up on that, you'll hear a lot more about it in the next few weeks as we prepare to make care packages for all of those there as well. Uh, speaking of Compassion Church, they've got uh, an interest meeting tomorrow night. So you've heard language the last couple of weeks where there had been info meetings. That was for you to ask questions, get to know more more about the church, hear Pastor Rob's heart, the vision, see what it will look like as they aim to launch in Anoka this summer. The interest meeting is slightly different language. This is now uh, for some of you who may have heard all of what Pastor Rob and uh, his team are going to do, and you say, man, that's what I want to be a part of. I want to be a part of the hands and feet that will be a church in Anoka, uh, making Jesus visible there. And so there's a meeting for those of you interested in actively being a part of that church. It takes place tomorrow night. I would encourage you to register for that at a CompassionAnoka.com on their website. You can register for that. It's a Zoom meeting tomorrow evening. and would love to have you participate in that as you have interest in joining them. I know alongside that, some of you are in the place to say, I've gotten some information and I want to support Compassion Church, but I don't yet think I'm going to go be a part of it. I want to stay a part of this church, but are there ways and opportunities for me to still participate, to partner with, to help send them well into accomplishing that mission in Anoka? And so I want to update you on some of that. One of those I've already mentioned. We're going to make care packages for all of the residents at the Stepping Stone Shelter. And so you'll have opportunity to participate as active members of Now Then in how we're partnering with Compassion Church in the work that they're doing. And some of you that have attended informational meetings have also wisely asked, okay, so as some of the funding is being raised for Compassion Church, is that just something that we would do personally? Is that something that Now Then Alliance, as we give to the Now Then Alliance Church, our funding is going to help? What does that look like? And so if you were at the, the meeting during Sunday school, you would have heard me say live, I'll be as clear about that when I possibly can. We've met with the board and gotten more clarity. I'll give that to you in a moment. If you came to Rob's informational meetings, what you would have seen is he had, a, he had a wish list. It's not the entirety of the cost of the, the beginning of the church, but a wish list of roughly $75,000 worth of things that it would take to, to get Compassion Church up and running. As he's in the process of budget planning and talking with our district about what it looks like to have uh, a first year and an ongoing three-year budget for the church, they're looking at what it looks like to raise that kind of funding. And as churches start, they often need some of that funding to come from outside of the church. So from outside of their own attenders, they expect gifts to come that way, but uh, they set expectations on what it looks like to raise money outside of that. And so Rob's hope, uh, Pastor Rob and Compassion's Church's hope in the first year is to raise $45,000-ish of outside funding. 
No, that'll go to cover uh, lots of different kinds of costs, startup things like laptops and cameras to be able to do digital media, banners, curriculums, all of that kind of stuff um, that it aims to reach, some staff salaries, those kinds of things. And some of you are wondering, okay, so what does that look like? Do we partner with that? Uh, Personally, what does that look like collectively? And so here's what I'll tell you has been decided. As a church, from the giving you do to Now Then Alliance Church, as a part of your generosity here and what you can feel excited about and celebrate because you give here, we're going to write a check for $20,000 to help with the startup costs. So Now Then Alliance Church and your giving towards it will help with a number of those kinds of costs. That's obviously not 45000 When we looked at Rob's wish list and saw uh, a number of the things, we said, man, we want to cover a lot of that um, organizational cost kinds of things. But one of the big uh, hopes for Compassion Church is to be a place of immediate compassion to people experiencing homelessness. And that will require a large benevolence fund. Many of you know that we have a benevolence fund so that we can give gifts to those in our church or those in the community that surround us as they have need. That will be even more heightened when a lot of the target demographic is people experiencing homelessness. And so part of that first year's hope for them is to start with a $15,000 compassion benevolence fund. The money we're writing as a church, that $20,000 check that we'll send, won't help that compassion fund. And yet... My hope, the board's hope, our leadership's hope is that collectively we would have personal giving from Now Then Alliance Church that would meet the needs of that compassion fund. We're hoping between now and summer to raise above and beyond people's normal giving, personal giving of 15000 extra dollars so that uh, from Now Then Alliance organizationally and our people that we would meet at least 35000 of that $45,000 that they're hoping to raise. There'll be details on how to give that if you go to Compassion Anoka and click the give tab there. Um, There's details on what it looks like to give there if you're ready to do that now. Uh, That might change in about a month when things transfer from being uh, run by a district fund that the current money is going towards to when Compassion has its own bank accounts and things like that. So there might be some changes to that. We'll update you on all of that and we'll keep informing you about this as we move forward and hoping to partner with and send uh, Compassion Church well to do its mission. But just wanted to let you know your, your normal giving to our general fund is going to so Port Compassion Church, and we're hopeful that above and beyond that, that we would have personal giving from our congregants to help launch them well towards the compassionate ministry they want to do to people experiencing homelessness as well. We're thankful for any ways that you're willing to participate in that, whether it's giving to our church or giving personally above and beyond that uh, to Compassion Church as well. I mentioned I would talk through some awesome ways to connect as well, and so I want to invite uh, the Pringle family, whichever ones of you are coming up this uh, service, it looks like Brent and Alyssa are going to come join me, and uh, they're going to talk a little bit about what their experience here at our church has been like. They're our newest members. Oh, I already got one. You'll each get one. You each get a microphone. How special. Um, And so this is Brent and Alyssa Pringle. They've been attending the church for a little bit. They'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, And they're our newest members. And so haven't been attending super long. Some of you may have seen them and recognized them. Some of you may still be getting to know them. So why don't you tell us who you are, how you found out about our church, how long you've been attending. Well, good morning. We're Brent and Alyssa Pringle, and we've been coming to Now Then for three months now. We found out about Now Then. Well, Alyssa, I'll let you talk about how you're... I just knew some of the Now Then women from the um, district women's retreat at Big Sandy. Barely knew them, but knew that Now Then was a good spot. (laughs) And uh, I have connected with um, Rick and Kirsten Wallace, who are the Envision site coordinators for Minneapolis in the past. And and so I've I've had some connection there for a little while. And when we moved to the area, I asked Rick, and this Now Then Alliance came up and said, there's some good people over there. You should check them out. So that's kind of how we got here. You must have come to the first service then. And yeah. Right. Just... <laughs> so when you came here, one of the things you all did was uh, chose to get involved in a small group. Why did you choose to do that? Well, for me, I think a lot of it is just being able to connect with adults. Um, we spend so much of our time with kids as well, but and we love the kids, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but it allows us just to connect with some adults and then also with a group of believers. You know, we as believers, we want to connect and grow and learn more from each other, some more seasoned veterans and 
and, and then also help others come along in their faith journeys too. And so just being able to connect as a group of believers and we're, we all have the same goal as to praise God and give him the glory, but it allows us to just connect as a group and, and learn together and go through life together. And, and then there's some accountability there as well. And so those are the things that I enjoy from it. Um, and then watching football games. There. <laughs> I need people. I don't know if you all need people. Some people don't need a lot of them, but I really do. And um, so when Nathan invited us just about right away to join small group, um, we jumped in, and I look at some of the people from our small group that are in this room. If, if you're them, you're the people we know in this area because we're new. And so you've blessed our lives, and I can't imagine not having joined because... Um, Walking out my faith is not an isolating thing. It's something I need to do with others, and so I'm grateful. Just moved to the area like three or four months ago or something like yeah. that, and so getting to know some of the people here. What are some of the things? You had some recent things come up at your house, and you were thankful to have a small group. What kinds of things has small group benefited outside of your everyday meet yeah, or your we, normal we meetings? Yeah, met this wonderful man that's a general contractor, and he's <laughs> helped us out with some house issues, and so, you know, just making some connections in that and just finding out who people are, you know, and what they, who they are outside of church and that and what their, what their stories are. That's, that's always fun. And, and I don't know a lot of you, but I've prayed for some of you already because that's what we do in small group is we lift you guys up. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's been enjoyable. Well, Pastor Nathan leads your group, and like most of your group is on that side of the worship center this morning. Any dirt you want to share about any of them? Yeah. They're all great. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I believe you, kind of. Uh, why should all of these people get into a small group if they're not in one? Um, well, it's, you know, as a body of believers, I believe that we're called to, to grow together and so and to study together. And so it's... Like I said, it allows me personally to connect with other people and, uh, and praise God and have that opportunity to do that. And we met some wonderful people, and I think that if you're not connected and you're kind of teetering on, well, you know, I don't know if I should or not, I would encourage you to do so because it allows you to get out of your comfort zone a little bit as well and, and just connect with fellow believers, and that's something that we're called to do. And so, Yeah, God created us for relationship, and I think it's really easy for myself personally, when I'm not connecting with other believers, to start thinking maybe my filthy rags are okay. You know, I think we need to be connecting together so we can help refine each other and hold each other accountable, and that's important to me. Well, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you all have gotten connected well and that a group has loved you. Would you guys thank for them for coming and introducing themselves, sharing their story? Thank you. If you're interested in getting connected with a small group, the passive way to do that, you can go to the back of the room under the connect word on the wall. All our small groups are listed there and the leaders and you can contact them, reach out to them. If you want a more active step, you can come and talk to me uh, after the service. I lead a small group. You can talk to Pastor Nathan. He leads a small group. Talk to Pastor Bruce. He leads a small group. Uh, We'd love to have you join us. There's other small groups besides staff-led ones as well. Um, And you can find out. We'd love to connect you with those. Uh, we're going to continue in worship by giving back to God some of what he's blessed us with. If you're here and, and want to do that, you can do so physically in the offering box in the back. If you're engaging digitally or didn't come prepared to do that here but still want to give, you can do that digitally via our website as well. We're excited about any of those gifts as they come to support the work of this church, to partner with other ministries, and to advance God's kingdom. And want to pray that these gifts would do just that. Would you join me in that prayer? God, we're thankful for what you've given to us, most importantly, the gift of life you've extended to us through Christ, and yet we recognize so many other gifts, connections with others, valuable relationships, and then blessings financially in our lives. And as we give some of those back to you, we pray it would be pleasing and acceptable to you as an act of worship. It would use these gifts to spread your love and grow your kingdom in a world that could desperately use more of it. Pray all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to teach you a song. I'll just sing the verse, and then I'll invite you to sing the verse after me, and then I'll sing the chorus, and then you'll sing the chorus after me. So just listen. This is how the verse goes. See him there, the great I am, 
a crown of thorns upon his head. The Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. Sing this with me. See him there. See him there. The great I am. A crown of thorns upon his head. The Father's heart displayed for us. Oh God, we thank you for the cross. This is how the chorus goes. Just listen to this part. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on his hands. Jesus, you will reign forever. now behold behold the lamb the story of redemption written on his hands jesus you will reign forevermore the victory is yours we sing your praise endless hallelujahs to your hope Yes, Lord, reveal yourself to us. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head, the Father's heart displayed for us. We thank you for the cross. Behold the Lamb, the story of... Sorry. <laughs> I totally made a mistake there. Um, that's, that's the first one since 1974, so that's not too bad. Is that, is that? Let's, 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 start it, let's start it again. <laughs> Probably shouldn't lie in church, should I? Yeah, probably not a good idea. Huh. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head, the Father's heart displayed for us. Oh. Thank you for the cross. Amen. Lift it up on Calvary's hill. We search your name, and even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Sacrifice. 
sacrifice for every sin our Savior died the Lord of life can't be contained I
Death could not hold you. The veil torn before you. Silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name. powerful name it is nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus just sing to him I
My hope this Valentine's Day is that you get to have appropriate expressions of love with the people who you uh, consider close to you, potentially as scripture would call us, to the people that are far from you as well. I get to spend my Valentine's evening with all three of my Valentines. I will take my daughter, my wife, and my mom out to dinner and I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully you get some enjoyable celebration time as well. We're continuing in our rhythm series, talking about what it looks like to be in rhythm with God. And we've just spent the last four weeks talking about what that looks like in prayer. What it looks like to be in rhythm with God as we pray with confession, with surrender, with thanksgiving, and with petition. That's what we were talking about last week. And I think most of us recognize that as we pray to God, and particularly as we have requests and petitions to God, we don't always get what we want. We looked at that last week and a number of the different factors that may play into that. And one of them uh, that we didn't talk about as much is because sometimes God is saying no so that he can teach us something. A story in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses has been uh, wandering with people in the wilderness for 40 years and they're getting ready to take over the promised land and Moses is reminding them of some of the things God has done in their lives and during that 40 years they've complained that they didn't get the food that they wanted, that it didn't have the spice level that they wanted, that they didn't get to sleep where they wanted, that they weren't getting water as conveniently as they wanted and they were constantly petitioning God for those kinds of things. Moses is telling them of some of the reason they didn't get yes answers when they asked for those things. This is what it says in verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Moses essentially says some of those things you asked for, God didn't give you because he was humbling you and testing you. It goes on to say at the beginning of verse 3, He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. 
God was doing this. He was humbling you. He was testing you. Part of the reason he wasn't giving you food was because he wanted to see what would happen as he provided a different thing than what you were asking for, something you didn't even know to ask for, something unknown to everybody. And here's why he says that he did that, the end of that verse. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Moses says to the people on behalf of God, part of the reason you didn't get the answers to your prayers was because I needed to teach you something. I needed to teach you that the words that come from God's mouth are more important than the food that goes in your mouth. That sustenance in your life isn't just about meeting nutritional needs. More importantly than that, it's about meeting spiritual needs. That you don't live just by bread. You live and are sustained by the words of God. For the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about what it looks like not just to be in rhythm with God in prayer, but what it looks like to be in rhythm with God in His Word. Today, primarily, we're going to talk about the importance of that. We're going to look through all of Scripture to see how much it emphasizes our time spent thinking about, meditating on, conversing with putting our actions around, our heart around, our time around God's Word. And then next week, we'll talk a lot more practically about what that looks like. What kind of plans are there? How do you do that daily? What's it functionally look like in your life? I'll reference that a little bit later this morning as well. But as we want to look at the importance of God's Word, we're going to do so by looking at a lot of different Scripture verses. If you have a Bible and are going to want to follow along, we'll be flipping quite a bit. We'll start in Deuteronomy Uh, And then we'll go. The only benefit is, is we'll just keep going the same direction. So we'll start in Deuteronomy. You only have to flip one direction. I won't make you jump back and forth a bunch. We'll keep going kind of in order through the Bible, starting in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 has some of the familiar language that Jesus even quotes later in the New Testament. Language like, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all of your strength. And then it goes on to say in verses 6 and 7, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Everywhere you go, day and night, at home or on the road, God's word should be on your lips. It should be a central focus of what you're doing. It should be in your hearts. You should be talking about it to your children. He continues in verses 8 and 9. Tie them, God's words, as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Wherever you go, have it on your lips, have it in your heart. Have it bound on your hands, that symbolizes your actions. Have it on your foreheads, that symbolizes your thoughts. It's on your lips, it's in your heart, it's in your actions, it's in your thoughts. Other verses use some of that language as well. It it won't come up on the screen, but in Deuteronomy 11, as Moses is talking to them about what it'll look like when they take over the promised land, that, that suddenly there will be sustenance from the ground, that they will have cattle that they will have livestock, that they will have the fruits that grow, that, that food will be plentiful, that the yes will have come. Moses is warning them that it's going to be easy to forget God. This is what he says. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. And then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain. The ground will yield no produce and you will soon perish from the good land the Lord is giving you. And then he says these words again. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates so that that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give you. God's word being everywhere is important. And originally, the people of God, particularly the Hebrew and Jewish people of God, took some of these verses literally. When it says to bind these things on your hands and foreheads, they did just that. A picture is going to come up on the screen uh, showing a, 
a Hebrew man praying with what's called phylacteries on. Phylacteries are the box that you see on his forehead and the one that's kind of on his bicep with the leather straps that goes down his arm as well. And this would have been because of these verses. They would have taken and inside those boxes, they would have placed a, either one scroll with four verses or four small scrolls with the four verses on them. Two of those verses would have been what we just read, the Deuteronomy 6 passage and the Deuteronomy 11 passage. And they would have added to it um, two different passages from Exodus chapter 13, which talk about this binding God's words on your hands and on your foreheads. They would have literally done this to remind themselves of it. Now, they wouldn't wear this all day. In typical Jewish practice, even still today, some who do that, they will wear it five days a week during their morning prayer. So on a typical weekday, they would get up, they would put these things on as they would go about their morning prayer time, reminding themselves that it's God's word and his scripture that they need to keep in their thoughts, in their actions, on their heart, on their lips. And so they will have gone through a process of binding them for that. God's word's importance. Following it is importance. A few chapters later in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter at all. Deuteronomy chapter 17, there we go. Uh, Moses is giving instruction about what a king should do if there's ever to be a leader over Israel. If they ask for a king over themselves, it starts with a list of things the king can't do. He can't marry uh, lots of wives. He shouldn't go back to Egypt and accumulate more horses. He shouldn't accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. But then it gives instruction, this is what the leader of God's people on earth is supposed to do if there's a king. Verse 18, When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It's to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. The most important thing the leader of God's people was supposed to do, read God's word, obey it, follow it, model it for God's people. It's not just the king as before there's kings as Joshua takes over and is installed as leader in Joshua chapter one, verse seven, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. It continues, keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. Your prosperity, your success, your hope, your endurance, your strength, it comes from meditating on God's word day and night. What we get the unfortunate thing of seeing is what happens when God's people lose God's word. When they stop reading it, stop listening to it, stop obeying it. 2 Kings chapter 22 tells that story. In verse 8, it says, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of law in the temple of the Lord. They had lost it. Generations had gone and God's people didn't have access to his word. And they find it. And so he goes and he takes it and he gives it to King Josiah. And this is what it says. Josiah says, Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for all the people, and for all Judah, about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us, because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. When we aren't attentive to God's word, when we aren't in rhythm with it, when we aren't meditating on it, when we aren't talking about it, when it isn't on our heart or our lips, in our actions or in our thoughts, it says, great is the Lord's anger that burns against us. It's supposed to be a rhythm of our lives. When we went through the Nehemiah series, we referenced that before they consecrated Jerusalem again with the walls being built, they spent time with public reading of scripture to remind themselves of what God had said. In Proverbs, getting out of some of the history books and law books into some of the wisdom literature, Proverbs chapter 30, verses five and six, every word of God is flawless. 
He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. God has revealed himself to us through this book perfectly. It's flawless and we don't have to add anything to it. It is enough to sustain us. We don't need any more. Moving on from the wisdom literature to the prophets, Isaiah talks about in chapter 55, he gives an analogy of God's words to us. This is how it begins. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Let me re-say re- that in, in our language. He's saying, Just like God sends water down from heaven and snow down from heaven, it doesn't just come down and then return back up to the clouds or up to God. It comes down and it does something. It nourishes the ground. It helps sustain what's been created. It provides fruit out of that. He says, just like that's true of the rain, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And God says it's important for us to to be in his word because it, it reminds us of the sustenance that comes from him, that we don't need anything else, that it gives us strength and courage, prosperity and success, that it flourishes within us and produces something. It never returns void. Maybe saying, well, Pastor Nate, that's all just the Old Testament. You're right. It's law, it's wisdom literature, it's prophecy, all from the Old Testament. I think we're, most of us are aware, though, the New Testament will speak highly of uh, the value of God's word as well. Matthew chapter 4, the words of Jesus. He's been led into the Spirit, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He's being tempted by Satan. And Satan's come to him after 40 days of fasting, and as Jesus is hungry, he says, If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, quoting the Deuteronomy 8 that we've already looked at. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We don't just need the sustenance of life. We need the sustenance of our spirit that comes from God and from his word. We should live by the word of God. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples. We looked at this uh, uh, between Christmas and New Year's, how he's uh, praying for us to be unified and for us to be like him. And this is what he says uh, in John 17, verse 17. It's Jesus praying to God to sanctify them, talking about us, by the truth. Your word is truth. It's what helps us become pure and holy and righteous. God uses it in our lives to sanctify us. The time we spend in God's word is important. As Paul's writing uh, to the church and believers in Rome, Romans chapter 15, verse 4, he says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. That it would be on our lips and in our hearts, that it would be in our actions and in our thoughts that we would recognize that it doesn't return void, that it helps bring prosperity and success, that it sanctifies us, that it gives us endurance and encouragement and hope. The word of God is valuable and important, life-giving and meaningful to us. As he's continuing to write, he writes to the church in Thessalonica, in Thessalonica, he says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. It's God's words, not just words written on a page, not just Paul's words, not just the words of men recorded as a historical document. It's God's words, and we should receive it that way because it then works in us. Later, as he's writing uh, to Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, he says of what Timothy should do with God's word, it says this, until I come, this is Paul talking about going to visit Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and teaching. We should be devoted to it. 
Some of us, when we talk about our spiritual disciplines, there's language, Christian kind of insider language that get used. We reference them as our devotions, that we would devote ourselves to things. We would devote ourselves in prayer. We would devote ourselves into the reading of Scripture. This is what Paul is encouraging, that we would have devotions. We would devote ourselves to God's Word. To our relationship with God that's found in it and through it to the reality that he reveals to us about who he is and about who we are to the encouragement and the hope we would meditate on it day and night and talk about it wherever we go. In, in his second letter to Timothy, he says, he says more about that in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. This is where we get our Awana program from. They get their name, Awana, from this verse. Approved workmen are not ashamed. It's the acronym from this verse. That we would be people who correctly handle the word of truth. A chapter later in 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17, he says this. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now let's be clear, there's been a lot of the positive things we've said about God's word, its encouragement, its hope, its sanctification work in our life. There's some hard things it does in us as well. It confronts us, corrects us, rebukes us, but in the process of doing so, equips us for every good work. When we sit and think, God, if you would just do this in my life, suddenly I'd be able to serve you. His answer is, no, 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 my word, it can equip you for that. You're equipped for every good work. As you, as you study and read and reflect on this inspired, God-breathed word, you can be taught, rebuked, corrected, trained in righteousness so that you can do all that you've been asked to do. The time we spend in God's word is important. Lastly, we'll look at the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. says it this way. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's not just words on a page. It's not even just God's word revealed to a man and recorded on a page. It's God's word on a page that is still living and still active that pierces and challenges, that judges and confronts, that equips and sustains, that encourages and provides hope. And it should be on our lips and in our hearts. And we should pass it on to our children. And we should talk about it when we're at home and when we're out in the morning and in the evening. Wherever we go, it should be with us. My hope as we spend the next couple of weeks talking about it is that we would recognize that God is hopeful that our rhythm of relationship with him would include daily interaction with him through his word. We talked about that with prayer, that our prayers of thankfulness, the rhythm is constant. And our hope is that the rhythm we have with God's word is constant as well. That that would serve us in getting to know better who God is, who we are in living, active relationship with him that never returns void and always provides his intention. Then next week, we'll talk about what that looks like practically. We'll jump into things like uh, what kinds of books are the best kinds of books to read? Do we read with Bible plans or do we read other things? Is there a right translation to read or what are the differences of translations? Should I read uh, a small section of verses and try to understand them deeply or large sections of the verses? Are you the kind of person who takes notes in your Bible or doesn't take notes in your Bible? How much do you memorize versus study versus... We'll get to the practice next week. This week, I want us just to focus on the value, the importance, the command, the instruction that we would spend consistent time in God's word. And one of the things that I've recognized in my own life, and I think is shown throughout scripture as well, is that for many of us, the time we spend in God's word doesn't produce its fruit always immediately while we're studying or reading it. 
Sometimes what happens is that the thing God wants to do from our time with his words doesn't show up until we recognize we need it later. We reference one of those stories. I'm going to turn back to it again in Matthew chapter 4. Jesus has spent 40 days in the wilderness fasting, and he's hungry. And Satan comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Satan didn't come that we know of while he was sitting there reading a scroll or reflecting on the scriptures. It wasn't that Jesus was in the middle of his devotions time with God and a unique verse from Deuteronomy happened to highlight itself perfectly in front of him. But Jesus has already spent time with God and in God's word. And Jesus has already understood Deuteronomy chapter 8, had already memorized it, had already heard the warnings given through Moses that were in it. And so he gets to see the fruit of his time with God and his word and his relationship through it in a time of tempting. And so Jesus answered, it is not written, man shall not live. It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's the imagery he uses as bread. That it's sustenance. God's word provides nourishment for us. No different than this bread mine. I'm a carb lover. I'll eat all the breads all the time. I, I generally don't eat them plain like this. I'd prefer butter or jelly or peanut butter or toasting it or doing something to it. But, but if I ate this, I think most of us understand there would be some nourishment value. And if I eat it plain, outside of maybe quenching some hunger, it won't immediately do a lot for me. It might end my hunger, but maybe some taste enjoyment, but I don't recognize its nourishment right away. Here's what I know, though. I haven't eaten yet today. And if I don't eat this bread and I go to work out in an hour, or if I do eat this bread and I go to work out in an hour, I'll notice the difference. My body will notice the difference. When it comes time to need the nourishment and the energy in a unique way, I'll know if I spent time getting it or not. I think the same is true with God's Word. We often have these times come up in our life, maybe it's like Jesus, where we are tempted by Satan, and it gets revealed to us really quickly if we've spent valuable time in God's Word or not, if we've been sustained spiritually or not. And the hope is that we would recognize that importance, and we would engage in participation with God's Word in ways that sustain us. And yet there's other imagery that Scripture gives to the Bible as well. Some of you, you may be familiar with them. It says things like it's, uh, God's word is a lamp unto our feet, that it shows us how to navigate and where to go and some of those kinds of things. But there's other food imagery that I want to focus on today. It talks about God's word like bread and sustenance and nutrition. But in Psalm 19, it talks about God's word in a different way. I'm going to read a number of verses, just the last of which will come on the screen. This is what the psalmist David says about God's words. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. And the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They, God's words, are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey. And then honey from the honeycomb. He references it not just as bread for sustenance, but honey as sweetness and luxury and dessert. That in our lives, God's word would be something active in a part of us to give us the nourishment we need, but it would also be the luxury that we enjoy and delight in. That it would do work in our lives and not return void. And some of that will be piercing and hard and judgment judgment and rebuke. And some of it will be endurance and strength and hope and joy. And God's hope and command is that we would navigate through life not alone, not just in rhythm with him in prayer, but in rhythm with him through what he has revealed to us and how he sustains us with it. So my hope is, as we'll talk about this far more practically next week, is that we would leave with an understanding of that value, but not just, hey, Pastor Nate, I agree that that's what Scripture says, but that we would also begin to put it in practice this week. Here's a few different ways you can do that. 
If you're looking to connect with somebody else as you think through some of what Scripture says, I'd encourage you to just begin by asking someone what Bible reading habits have been most helpful for them. Where have they found sustenance or luxury from reading God's Word? Where has it been delightful and valuable in their lives? And have conversation about what that looks like so maybe you can learn about how it could be valuable in your life. If you're looking to put it into practice while growing and focused on growing in your relationship with God, I'd encourage you to read Matthew 4, 1 to 11. That's Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Read it every day this week and write down what sticks out to you each day. One day that may be the unique way that that Satan tempts Jesus that you relate with, or one day it may be what Jesus quotes that you relate with. Uh, Find it maybe as you read the same thing every day that God says something different to you through it each day. If you're looking to participate in what God is doing in your life or in the world around you, maybe you'll spend time this week memorizing the three verses Jesus used to refute Satan. Because most of us will be tempted by Satan at some point as well. And maybe it will be helpful for us to use some of the same resources from God's word Jesus did. The, the references that he quotes are listed there. They're all from Deuteronomy. Uh, but you can just memorize the way Jesus to recites them in Matthew chapter 4 as well. Regardless, my hope is that we would be people who value God's word, recognizing it not just as words from men written on a page, not even just the words of God recorded for history's sake, but the living and active words of God that won't return void as we engage with them still. Now let's pray till that end. God, I long to be sustained, and I long to delight in the luxuries of your word, to be sanctified, to be encouraged and brought to hope, to be prosperous and successful, to be trained and taught and equipped for every good work. I recognize that, that while engaging with you through your living and active word, that will happen. I pray also it corrects what needs to be corrected, rebukes what needs to be rebuked pierces what needs to be pierced. That my actions, that our actions would be as people who take your word and place it in our hearts and keep it on our lips, remind ourselves of it with our actions, bind it to our thoughts. Help us to do that this week in whichever way you may lay upon us to do it. Help us to be faithful and active in that so that when we need that nourishment, when we need that sustenance, when we need to see that you've worked in us, it will have happened because of the time we've spent with you. Do that work in us in a way that only you can, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As you go, go with grace, go with peace, and go and engage with the living and active God through his living and active word. Happy Valentine's Day. You are dismissed.